J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and today I have an exceptional author for you all. Jason King, he's come on the show to talk about his epic book, The Puppet Show, a story of superheroes, metahumans, troubleshooters, dealing with loss, fear, challenges, anger issues, and controlling what I think are narcissists. The world is not black and white, but sometimes the shades of grey don't matter. Jason himself describes the book as classic style comics. And I thought, "Mm, okay, that's an interesting viewpoint. But he says it's the classic style comics for the modern world in novel form. Mm. Jason is from Beaver Creek, Ohio, in the United States. He lives with his wife, Joanne Elizabeth, who is known to all her family and friends as Beth. Jason was born in Michigan, but has lived in numerous places across the United States of America. He has two degrees, has served in the U.S. Air Force, both at home and abroad. He currently works, as he puts it, everyone, slinging coffee and sarcasm at the local Tim Hortons chain Cafe Emporium. (laughs) I can just see him doing that. I really can. His dream is to be a renowned author, respected both by the public and those peers in the writing fraternity. So let's invite him on the show to find out more about him and this mammoth book he has written. Jason King, come and join me. Good evening, John. How are you doing today? I'm doing extremely well, and I am so glad that we've finally managed to connect. (laughs) Yes, sir. Same same here. (laughs) This, everybody, has been a mammoth, a mammoth (laughs) connection, but we won't go into that. (laughs) Now, Jason, before we open the book, would you care to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? And why the book? And particularly, why the title? I am intrigued about this title, The Puppet Show. Who are you? Why did you write the book? And why the title? Okay. Well, I'm Jason King, as advertised. And that's not a pen name, by the way. That's my actual name. And like I mentioned, I've lived all over the country, but... uh, Oregon, Florida, Texas, North Carolina. Uh, I was in the Air Force, and I've held numerous jobs, and I imagine each one has shaped me somewhat. Um, Who I am, uh, most importantly, I am best husband, but uh, deep in my soul, I'm a writer. I'm a storyteller, and particularly in written form. Um, and as for the, well, why, why this, I, I like comics and, you know, I like the classic style, which for me, my generation would be, you know, seventies, eighties, nineties. And, uh, it's, it's a little different now. now. So I, I write these, these, stories because um the characters tell tell the stories to me and i write it yeah that's how i've done all my writing uh most of my life um the name the puppet show the bad guys behind the scenes are just that puppet masters just, just what they're called um it's it's kind of a old old plot line the the you know, kingmakers behind the scenes pulling the strings and everything, but uh, it's done a little differently in in this case. And you're right, there <laughs> to be one of these people, you know, you you have to be a narcissist, and right? you have to believe that you personally and the decisions you make are best for the entire world, whatever anybody else thinks, and you know. That that takes a lot a lot of gall, you know. The only the only other uh, if you got that much gall, the only the only other 
uh, jobs open to you or politician or talk show host. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> okay. Jason, let's have a look at the book. It's a pretty lengthy book. You know, it's got 580 oh, pages. And the story within those pages is, maj is majestically told over 24 chapters. There are a whole variety of characters. The, the whole cast is absolutely brilliantly blended to make the story. But Thomas Brody, for me, nicknamed Shocking Blue, is the main character. Now, Jason might disagree, but that is just my opinion, everybody. But there you go. And the subject matter is fascinating with the plot talking about loss, fear, anger, challenges, and incorporating or narcissist controlling issues. I find the ideology behind the metahumans interesting and totally beguiling. Now, before the podcast, you you and I, Jason, we agreed on certain chapters so as to showcase the book at its best. But more importantly, give the audience a taste for what is in this book. For the whole concept, everybody, of doing this podcast interview is to give you, the audience, a flavour of what's in the book. It's not about to go into great detail. It's not about to disclose what's happening towards the end because the idea is that you were tempted to go and have a look at this book, buy it, and find out for yourself what unfolds within these pages. But we're going to go to chapter one to start off with. Um, now, the cast in this chapter is amazingly well assembled, everybody. And all of them seem to be exceptionally gifted in their own field of expertise. For me, the characters, Galvin Urban, Shocking Blue, One-Eyed Jake, Beer, Professor Sophia Malorio, the Magnus, Night Critter, really, really stuck out. Yes, there are other characters, and they all seem to be brilliantly interacting with each other, but not always agreeing with each other. Hmm. So my question to you, Jason, is, who are these characters? What's their role in the narrative? Why the nicknames? What is smart? And who is the new kid on the block? Cody Blaine, Sharp Shot, The Masked Man. So let's start with the characters. Who are these characters? Okay, Calvin Urban is the tech expert, you know, te technology engineer, inv inventive genius. And uh, he's also the resident skeptic. You, know, it's, you, you run into demons and... He he won't even refer to them as demons. He's he's uh, you know other dimensional beings, but there there's a rational explanation for this. Yeah. Um, the Magus, on the other hand, is a master of magic, and he's he's much more open minded to to these things because he knows for a fact that they exist. But he's got his own rough edges. Um, let's see. Shocking blue. He's he's pretty normal for a guy whose skin and hair are blue, and you know who generates who, who generates electricity. But um, he's from Chicago. And he's uh he's very, fairly uh personable. You know, you, you could. You could uh, get along with him, relate to him more. Yeah, you know? um, Nick uh, Night Critter is uh, she's she's a mutant. That is, she's a type of metahuman that is born with the powers. Um, you know, just from genetics, and uh, she is kind of a bright spot. You know, she is. An example of Christianity at its best, you know, non-judgmental, just, you know, 
li- living at peace with herself and others. Um, you mentioned Professor Malorio. Yeah. She, she is, uh, she has, she's the one with, with, she's the brains of the outfit. Like, I mean, even more than Calvin Urban. She's open, open minded, a lot more open minded than he is and has knowledge over a broader, broader field of, of studies or anything. Um, she's almost the, the definition of diversity is our strength. And, uh, and she's also the adoptive mother of B, who you also mentioned, maybe baby sister. Um, one eyed Jack is the creator of smart. I believe you asked what, what does smart stand for? Yes. What does it stand for? Okay. It's, it's an, it's an acronym. This stands for Society for Metahuman Advancement, Research, and Training. I wonder. But, you know, I love the character One-Eyed Jack. Oh, he's... He's He's my favourite. Quite interesting. Huh? He's my favourite. Really? (laughs) Yes. Yes, absolutely. He's my favourite. Yes. I just kind of channeled John Wayne with him in a lot of ways. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. he's he's been around he's seen stuff and he and you know he he doesn't really care about your bs because he's he's seen it before and he's got a job to do okay yeah. so who's the new kid on the um, block sharp shot who's this new kid on the block okay so he's one of my favorites he is uh he's a north carolina mountain boy and he's what he knows is the bow now, he, he's also a wilderness expert and everything, but you know he he can shoot just about anything. But the bow is his his thing, and uh, he he's in the city not not necessarily by his choice, but you know circumstances brought him there, and you know gave him reason to stay, and so he's he has been brought in to join the group to. Pretty much keep him out of trouble. Yeah, he's he's uh, he was making some waves on his own, and they're like, "We'll bring him into the team. We can use him, and you know, we'll keep him out of the trauma wards." <laughs> but yeah, he's he's a country boy. Yeah, he's pretty straightforward. He's like he's he's got some personal sets and sets of rules and. That's what he lives by, you know. One one of which is you you don't you don't uh, insult women. Yeah, that that comes no. in in a scene, but yeah, it doesn't work out for you to insult the lady of the house. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, Jason, let's go to chapter three. And Jason, you introduce us to Thundering Eagle here and a Thunder Thumper. And we start to see a sense of how the team gels together. Now, what I would like to do here is read the first few paragraphs, everybody. So I'm going to read them. And then I'm going to ask Jason to ask, to explain to you all what's going on in this part of the book. Um, And also, Jason, where are you taking the reader? And is the story here vital to the whole concept of the book? So just let me read uh, a couple of paragraphs here, okay? All right. This is chapter three, everybody. It wasn't the entire ceiling, of course, but it did leave a roughly 30 foot by 30 foot hole in that roof. The debris crashed to the floor between Thundering Eagle and the villains, having their approach to each other and drawing their attention upward. Even Meat Slab looked for the source of this sudden disturbance. As they looked up, shocking blue flew down through the hole and then pulled up, hovering in place with an energy that blasts ready. The next moment, baby sister and night crater teleported into the chamber, flanking the group within on either side, Bea to the villain's right, Nikki to their left. Immediately following was Sharp Shot, suspended from a repelling line. He stayed hanging at just about 10 feet above ceiling level. 
40 feet above the floor, with an arrow on string. Finally, Professor Malorio descended into view, her anti-gravitation belt and adaptive carbine looking rather incongruous in tandem with her white lab coat, skirt, blouse and sensible shoes. You are in violation of numerous laws and status, the professor announced clearly. You have a single opportunity to avoid forceful apprehension via the expedient of immediate surrender. That opportunity is afforded to you now, and I advise you not to squander it. I hoped to see you soon, Circle called out cheerfully, clearly delighted to see the heroes. How perfectly wonderful of you to save me the trouble of coming to look for you. But where is Glory Starshield? I especially wanted to invisciate her. She ended in a pouting tone. So what's going on in this part of the book, Jason? You know, where are you taking the reader? And is this chapter such a substantial chapter that really starts to reveal what's coming down the line? Okay, well, what's happening is um, Thunder Thumper's broken into the prison to break out the other two, and the troubleshooters have responded. Thundering Eagle was already there on business of her own. Uh, nobody knows who she is, but when the trouble broke out, uh, instead of just leaving, she went ahead and and uh, tried to pitch in to help, and she was quite uh, in quite over her head, but then the uh, troubleshooters have arrived just in the nick of time. Now, of course, they got the problem of they don't know who she is either, so, you know, they, she's got to establish that she's one of the good guys, but yeah, that's that. That's a fairly simple, uh, simple problem, but basically, this is a chance for, as you mentioned, Co Cody Blaine is a new new kid on the block. Like this is his very first uh, foray as a member of the team, and they need to see how he does. And it does show how the troubleshooters work together, and it introduces Thundering Eagle, who is very important to the ongoing plot of the book. So, um, and it shows uh, Circle and Meat Slab, who were introduced in an earlier book, um, and introduces Thunder Thumper, who. I get while not necessarily super important going forward, he is a uh presence going going forward through through uh this and future books. Um he's he's an interesting case. Oh, y'all you, you asked before about why the nicknames yeah. in comics. Uh there there's always two identities you got the costumed identity and then you have a code name and then you know your own identity and the code code names i always try to make mine match the people's powers and other such so uh that that's why i like shocking blue you know he's blue and he uses electrical powers you know that that kind of thing and Thunder Thumper, he punches things. There's an explosion, and yeah, you know, so. Um, and Thundering Eagle is winged, and she uses sonic powers, like vo her voice. So, uh, and yeah, so I'd say it's so it's an important very chapter important in the book, isn't it? It is. It's it's kind of a hinge, yeah. You know? It's uh, it's a nice battle for people who like action and everything, but it also opens a door for uh, going on to the next stage of the story. So, 
Ah, now let's go on to the next stage. Now, for me, Jason, two chapters I found are pivotal to the plot, and they are chapters six and seven. They're pivotal, for I understand you introduced the puppet masters, who are fascinating, to say the least, but when I looked at their characteristics, their background and their objectives. But in this area of the book, you also introduce the manipulators, and again, their characteristics and motives are quite revealing. What I liked most about this section of the book was the first sign of a huge clash of the troubleshooters and the manipulators and the lengths some members within those teams will go to protecting their teammates and Mm -hmm. their beliefs and judgments. Now, Jason, in your own words, can you give the audience a glimpse into what is going on in this section of the book? Because I loved these two chapters. It's powerful. There's a lot of energy going on here. But you tell the story here. You wrote it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, uh, the puppet masters are, they want to rule the world, right? But... Ruling the world is a lot of work, so you get, you have to have minions. You know, if, if you're going to be a, a villainous overlord, you got to have minions. And in a world that is rediscovering metahumans, you got to have some metahuman minions or you're not going to get too far. So the puppet masters have gathered together these various uh, mostly criminals and formed them into a team called the Manipulators. And they through uh, through carrot and stick, they they get them to work for them. But the problem is, um, these are criminals. And the problem with crime is the company you end up keeping. Yeah, you, know, you you don't get the best the best friends and everything when when you're a criminal. And you don't, most of them you? are. Huh? You don't get the best friends, do you? Oh no, no. no. <laughs> this whole honor amongst thieves, yeah, well, you know, um, but yeah, they're uh, some of them are well, they're all pretty, pretty, you know, got pretty high opinions of themselves, and, and some of them are very mean spirited. Uh, you mentioned narcissists, and that describes the puppet masters perfectly, but it describes some some of these manipulators pretty well too. Uh, now there is one who uh, they brought her in thinking of her as, as a criminal, but she doesn't see herself as a criminal. She's just she sees herself as basically a vigilante and anti-terrorist. But she, since she's not working for any government, yeah, you know, some some see her as a criminal. Uh, she's she is one you know possible breaking point for them uh but the problem is all these strong personalities and uh uniting them via money or you know we hurt you if you try to back out only gets you so far um so in the first in chapter six you meet these these people and then in chapter seven they get they have their first mission and that brings them into conflict with the troubleshooters uh ba- basically they're raiding the same prison that they just had the one attempt on um and they catch the troubleshooters there trying to fix up the prison to hold metahumans and you know they they do all right because they they uh, catch them by surprise. They do, but, don't they? Yeah, they do catch some by surprise, and they do do yeah. all right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I want to go now, Jason, to um, towards the middle of the book. Uh, okay. You know, for you know, chapters eleven through to thirteen and fourteen. Mm-hmm. Now, I get the sense and feeling that things are hotting up here. Tempers are hotting up. Tensions within some of the teams is fracturing under pressure. Now, in Chapter 11, we see the impact of losing three 
of the troubleshooters and the mm. team's efforts to regain them back. Plus, new team members and allies appear on the scene. We start to see how SMART supports metahumans outside of its own organization. To in chapter 13, and how the tension within the manipulators creates a scene of crumbling apart in chapter 14. For me, this is an intense, um, action-packed section in the book. So would you care to tell us what's going on here without giving too much of the storyline away? I don't definitely care to do that. Um, so, as mentioned in the earlier chapter, the, the uh, manipulators do pretty good with this first uh, first mission because they catch the troubleshooters separated, and you know they're not all together, and they're not expecting an attack, so they catch them by surprise. They catch them scattered. Well, they they manage to, as you mentioned, they get they get away with three of the troubleshooters. They they've captured them. Um, so now comes the fallout. Now now comes the doubt and the self doubt and the. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a group situation where something went wrong, but oh yes, oh okay. uh, mm-hmm. it. It doesn't really matter whose fault it was or if it was anybody's fault. Everybody's got a finger, and they're all pointing it at somebody else because I don't know what happened, but it wasn't my fault. You know, no, so, not my fault. Yes. Not my fault. It's his. It's her. Yeah. It's me. He, he let down. She wasn't doing her part, you know, and one of, one of the team members is taken – has a spouse and that spouse had stayed behind because they they weren't oh uh, they weren't officially on the team but oh uh, now they're they're blaming the whole team for their spouse being taken and this is this is the first obstacle that they have to hurdle to get back on. You know, they always say if you fall off a horse, you get back on. You know, well, before you can get back on the horse, you got to get over that fear in in your mind. You know, you got to make yourself get back on the horse. And this is that fear. You know, this is that. You know, blaming each other, and you know, and and so much of it is coming out of fear for what's happening to the three who have been taken. Yeah, because they don't know who these people are. They don't know what they want with them. And, you know, and they sure don't know how to get them back. Well, they're, they're having to do the investigation and, you know, they, they get a, they get a clue and then, uh, Urban goes off on his own to check and check it out. And, uh, he runs into a little bit of trouble, as tends to happen when you get hot headed and run off on your own. But he does you get know, into trouble, doesn't he? Oh, he does. Yeah. Oh, he does, everyone. He gets into trouble. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, you know, that happens. You know, it's it's part of a superhero's life. And and uh so then they you know, having gotten the idea of where where the bad guys are. Now they have to make their plans, and they have to go do it. This is all bringing them together. They had fractured a bit, but now they're coming together as heroes do. You see, these are these are people with amazing abilities and whatnot, but that's not what makes them heroes. What they do with it is what makes them heroes. And... and uh, what what you do with it depends on what you've got inside you. You know, they are at heart selfless, and that's what's going to bring them through. Whereas, as mentioned, the manipulators are mostly criminals and everything, very self-centered. And 
you start seeing how that works too. Some of them are better than than others. What? So uh, some of them are better than others, but but uh, overall, you that's that's the deal. And even as the troubleshooters are coming together, the manipulators are kind of falling apart. And the setting this sets up for for the uh, conflict at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hold that thought. Now, Jason, okay. I want to take the readers to chapters 18 and 22. All right. They're removing down the book, but not going quite to the end, for we do not need to, man- we need to maintain suspense, but without giving the storyline away. So let's take them in order, chapter 18. Now, I'd like to read the first few paragraphs. Now, this is on page 469, everybody. So I'm going to read them. And then I'm going to ask um, Jason to tell us what's going on here. So for me, so let's go to uh, chapter 18. This is what it says. This is what he's written. Baby sister appeared suddenly in a rocky outcropping of the mountain slope, accompanied by ironwood, construct and knockdown. She took a deep breath and looked around, getting her bearings. Ironwood leaned on his staff with his habitual impassivity, but his eyes, as always, were active and alert. Knockdown was muttering to himself and smacking his fist into his palm over and over, glancing back into the jungle below. Constant was the first to break the lengthening silence. Where do we go from here? She asked practically. We have to get into the mountain and find Professor Mummy and the others, Pia replied determinedly. I know that, Constant agreed. I'm just wondering about the how of it. We could, for instance, climb to the top and try to link up with the Colonel's party, or we could head for that sea cave that was on the map. We'd have to do some swimming, but we could probably get in that way. Knockdown shrugged unhappily. Either way, though it's a maybe, we don't know if that cave really goes into the base or not, or even if it's a trap and we don't know where the Colonel and the others are by now. Why don't we just go in through that cave there? Ironwood suggested quietly. They all looked at him questioningly, and he nodded up the slope to where he apparently had spotted something. They studied the slope, hopefully, but all any of them saw was rock and dirt. Beer turned her head back to look at Ironwood with a puzzled, quizzical frown. I don't see any cave, Mr Arnwood, she piped up in a questioning tone, just a short, or frustrated. He smiled back at her gently. Trust me, little one, it is there, he replied. That's good enough for me, Construct said, and began climbing the slope. Her mechanical hand formed into a pick axe to help her make the ascent. The others followed her, labouring up the slope. Nocturn had to pick Veer up and boost her in a couple of places. She needed to find better hand and footholds to continue a climb. Only Ironwood seemed to move effortlessly up the slope, apparently unaffected by gravity. When they all finally caught up to their comrade, she was standing on a ledge and studying what looked like nothing more than a large boulder. She had a smirk on her lips as she contemplated the huge rock. It's a hologram, she told them positively, hearing them approach. A pretty high-end one, too. Uh, how can you tell? Knockdown asked her, frowning at the store. Looks real enough to me. So, I found this, you know, an extremely important chapter. What's going on here? Okay, so... They they found they found the manipulator's base. 
you know, the puppet master base for the manipulators are, and they've made their attack. They're in a mountain. The base itself is is inside a mountain, a volcano, as a matter of fact. Uh, they're using geothermal heat for for energy for their their uh, base. So they they make a two pronged attack. The colonel Colonel uh, One Eyed Jack really leads one party in through the top from the air, and then another party come in came in by land. Okay, these people are that party, except they have had to leave Sharp Shot behind in the jungle to face uh, Thunder Thumper and Circle alone. So they're they had to do it because they had to go go forward and do and do the mission, but they're worried about him, you know, and they're worried about their other comrades. So, uh, and they're frustrated because they can't find the way in. These three are not; they're not ones that were on the team from the beginning. In fact, uh, the three with B are. Uh, people that they recruited for this mission. They're not uh, official troubleshooters at all. Knockdown and Ironwood are prospective members. They're they're in training, but they've kind of had to be brought up to you know to the front lines. And constructs is actually their construction engineer. You know the, the foreman of their building teams and everything she is a metahuman in in fact she's bionic she's lost an arm and it was replaced with a bionic arm that can mold and meld itself into different types of tools uh such as the pickaxe she used to climb up the mountainside but they are looking for the way in uh her expertise with holograms and such has helped her to discern this this uh, hologram that's covering the cave that none of them saw except for Ironwood. Ironwood was able to detect it because he is he's what he is exactly is rather mysterious, but he has a connection with nature that's uh, preternatural and particularly plant objects. His his staff that was mentioned. Uh, it's wood, but he can change. He can not only change it into different forms, like, you know, change, put a face on it or whatever. He can not only do that, he can change the type of wood that it is. And so, no, uh, he's able to tell when there's, when there's a cave there that's being hidden. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, knockdown is, he's your standard, uh, so somewhat uh, durable and strong type, and he's he's a fighter. Yeah, he he's a uh, boxer by by uh, trade. I just want to go to still on chapter eighteen, everybody. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to read a little bit more, which is further down the chapter here, and it's on page four hundred seventy four. Uh, with an explosive punch, Thunder Thumper shattered a jungle palm tree. His actual target, Sharp Shot, has somersaulted out of the way of the blow, coming up on his feet, bow in hand, with arrow knocked. The bowman fired that arrow straight into his opponent's right buttock. Due to the toughness of Thumper Thunder's hide mm -hmm, and his Kelber pants, the arrow didn't penetrate very far, but then Sharp Shot didn't need it to. His purpose was to hold the big man's attention, not take him out. Yet he deemed it a success. Therefore, when the black man, roaring in pain and rage, whirled around to renew his pursuit of the elusive archer, Sharp Shop was used to hunting dangerous game. Though, and he smirked at the juggernaut, bellowed dire threats at him. You damn Jack Rabbit, you can't avoid Bill Edmondson. Forever once I get my hands on you. I don't have to dodge you forever, Thunder Thighs, Sharp Shot called back, just until you trip over your own clodhoppers and knock yourself out. 
That should be just about any minute now. Unfortunately, the big bearded Bimoff was not working solo. Cycle had disappeared into the jungle moments before. Now she reappeared, dropping at sharp shot from overhead, slicing at him with her deadly hula hoop. It's a great little story part here, isn't it? It's one of my favorite parts. I'm glad we agree here. <laughs> um, you know, so what I'm doing here, everybody, is just giving you a um a brief glimpse as to the style of Jason's writing and what you can expect in this epic mammoth action-packed book that he's written. Now, I said to you that, you know, we're going to go to chapters 18 and 22, so we've covered off chapter 18, so now let's go to chapter 22. And the reason we're going to for chapter 22 is that it's pretty near the end, so there are some hints and tips as what's going to happen in the final chapter, but without giving the game away, because that's not the idea of this podcast. So let's turn to chapter 22. I looked at the opening scene of this chapter. You've got the scene set here in a laboratory and there's an intense battle going on between Winterfire, Night Critter, a Decredium. Now, I know I've got that wrong, but I'm going to let uh, Jason tell us how to pronounce that. You talk about machines, facets, Facets number five and six. What's happening here? And I think there are strong clues as what's coming down the line in the finale. Am I right? And who are? What are these Dodger Chandrans? Have I nearly got it right there? <laughs> nearly. <laughs> nearly. <laughs> the, the word is dodecahedron. And it means a twelve-sided object. Ah, oh. this uh, this machine it has it hovers and it's a twelve shi- twelve-sided you know spheroid. And each a- the puppet masters speak through it, and each time one of them speaks, one of the facets lights up and it has the number on it. Um, but when number one speaks, the whole thing lights up. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, so that, that's, that's what the dodecahedron is. The, uh, what's going on with this lab battle is this is fair, fairly late in, into the fight. And, uh, the, Two of the three that were captured have managed to uh, free themselves, but they're still in the base. So, and uh, one of them is having to deal with the fact that the other one is, has been badly injured. Um, she's trying, and she's trying to uh, help her uh, restore her enough to health to be able to move her. Oh, uh, so the other one had had to go and try and link up with with the troubleshooters coming in. Uh, she found one of them, but this dodecahedron found them and has driven them back to this lab. And now they're now they're having to uh, defeat this thing or die. Oh, uh, it's it's got. You know, missiles and lasers and stuff in it that it can pop out and shoot at them and everything. And it's 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 a it's a classic fantastic comics brawl. Yeah. You know. But but yeah, this this uh machine is basically the on site presence of, of the puppet masters. Of course the puppet masters themselves are elsewhere, you know, away from danger because this kind of person is well that's what minions are for yeah you have your minions face face the danger and 
you know, the fallout of, of, uh, battle. You don't put yourself in that position. Yeah. So, you know, this book, Jason, was this a labor of love or a tortuous journey at times or a mixture of both? I'd say a mixture of both, but, but leaning more towards the labor of love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there, any, any project that you do, there's going to be times of torturous labor. I mean, yeah. And, but by and large, yeah, it's, it's a labor of love. I, I love writing. And this, this book came a lot easier than uh, the first one had. And uh, it's you know I, was, I guess I was getting my stride and everything, but but yeah, it was it was fun. It it was a fun romp. I I just hope that my my readers will enjoy it as much as I enjoyed writing it. I'm sure they will. What's coming down the line? What's next for you, Jason King, as an author? Any more books? Coming? Uh, I, I have I have uh, more of. The books in this series uh, already ready, and I'm always working on my latest one. And, you know, haven't haven't even come close to running out of ideas on that. Plus, I have a, a, se- a seven part fantasy series that I'd like to get. No, uh, I I wrote that back in the '90s. I'd like to go ahead and get it cleaned up and published at some point and you must uh, have been young then back in the 90s oh yeah um <laughs> see yeah i was late teens or early 20s in in the 90s so but yeah i was wrote wrote that seven book series or wrote another uh two two book i guess that'd be a duology um uh, also fantasy but a whole other world and yeah so i've got no end of books <laughs> to publish when i can get them done yeah get them published but but is, yeah is that in between is that in between slinging coffees and sarcasm at oh Tim yes <laughs> oh yes that's that's just what I do for some spending cash. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, writing do- doesn't pay much until, well, you get your big break and suddenly it does, you know, which may or may never come. Yeah. I mean, how, how long was, how long was it before JK Rowling, you know, made, made, got her break. <laughs> so. Uh, she just got lucky. <laughs> so just got lucky but anyway who do you write your books for you know who would you like to see you know reading your books um well the easy answer to that is everybody but i guess this would probably be young adults and better because um there are some adult themes to it that you know might not be appropriate to to like little kids but then again, those kinds of things, well, I was going to say those kinds of things tend to go over their heads, but these days, maybe not so much, given what they see on TV and everything. But, you know, but yeah, definitely young adults and up, you know, anybody that likes superheroes, you know, or science fiction or uh, fantasy, for that matter, there's, there's some of every everything in, in comic books. Yeah, and in this series. So, where can people get your books from? Okay, you can get it off of barnesandnoble.com, uh, amazon.com, um, iUniverse's uh, publishing is like iUniverse.com or something like that. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, you can't get them out of brick and mortar stores. You have to go online and order them, or I'm told if you go into a brick and mortar store, you can put in a special order for it. But you know, they may also just tell you, "Well, go online, do it yourself." Yeah, so. probably the latter. Probably the latter. <laughs> probably. probably the latter. Jason King, thanks for joining me on the show today. 
Uh, thanks, thanks for me. having me. Oh, and thank you for the huge pleasure of giving me the opportunity to look at your book, The Puppet Show, everyone. Jason King, everyone. I'm Jesse Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you are in the world. Until next time, stay safe.